Hello. Good morning. Welcome to day two of uh, KubeCon. I'm really excited to be here in beautiful Barcelona. And I'm grateful to the CNCF for giving me this chance to tell you about how we at Spotify, like Brian said, deleted our production Kubernetes clusters accidentally twice, but with little to no end user impact. Now, I actually just am curious, raise your hand if you have accidentally deleted a production cluster. I just want to get a sense. Cool. Yeah, look at that elite club out there. Yes, I see you. All right. Uh, briefly, just about myself and Spotify. I'm an infrastructure engineer. Spotify is a music streaming company with over 100 million subscribers and over 200 million monthly active users. And inside the company, we have over 1,000 developers that are continuously deploying code to over 10,000 virtual machines. And a little bit more about on context of Spotify's compute environment uh, that you're going to need to understand some of the stories that I'm going to tell you. So Spotify uses Google Cloud Platform. And for the purposes of this talk, we have two types of engineering teams at Spotify, teams that build infrastructure and teams that use this infrastructure to build their features that uh, you would see if you open the app. And we'll call the former infrastructure teams, and we'll call the latter feature teams. Uh, my team builds infrastructure related to Google Kubernetes Engine. And for the purposes of this talk, again, we'll call my team the cluster operators, and we'll call the feature teams the cluster users. Uh, so currently at Spotify, we're helping all uh, stateless backend services migrate over to GKE. And at the time of these incidents, uh, we were only running a subset of uh, services, uh, partially each on GKE. I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means later. Uh, so we have three production clusters at the time of the stories, one in each of three regions, US, Europe, and Asia. And we were backing up each of them once every hour. Story time. All right, so I love stories. I want to tell you two of them. And the first one is about how I accidentally deleted this cluster. And the other is about how my coworkers, when trying to prevent that from ever happening again, uh, they accidentally deleted this cluster. <laughs> and it gets better, because in the process of trying to recreate this cluster in Asia, that happened. <laughs> OK, so how exactly did this happen, and how did we prevent any end user impact so that people could keep listening to the music that they love? So it was November 2018, and I wanted to test the GKE feature. So I created a new GKE test cluster in a test project. And I wanted to have the same configuration as our production clusters. So I opened two browser tabs, one for the production one, one for the testing one. I finished my test, and I wanted to delete that test cluster. And I had the wrong tab open. So I was freaking out. And on Slack, I remember asking my colleague, how do you, how do you stop this? Is there any way to stop this? I had deleted a 50-node production cluster uh, running dozens of workloads. Um, so with GKE, it's actually really easy to create a cluster. That's what's really awesome about it. You click one button, you get everything, masters, nodes. You get networking all set up. You get authorization. Unfortunately, with GKE, it's also really easy to delete an entire cluster. So with one click of a button, everything goes away, masters, nodes, authorization, networking. And so is there a way to stop it? And I learned the hard way that, no, there's, there's just no way to stop it. You just wait for it to clean up all of the compute instances, and then you kind of like hold your breath, and hopefully nothing too bad happened. You try to recreate it. So let's talk about how we recreated this cluster. Uh, it took us three hours, and 25, uh, three hours and 15 minutes to restore it, fix all of our integrations with it. Um, the restoration time took this long because we found bugs in our cluster creation scripts that we hadn't exercised a lot. Uh, our documentation uh, was incomplete and sometimes just had mistakes in it. And our cluster creation process wasn't resumable, so sometimes it would fail halfway. And uh, we had to restart from the very top. We didn't design it to be resumable from the middle, so this wasted a lot of time. 
Okay, so we thought about how would we, you know, human mistakes happen, how are we going to prevent this from happening again? And we wanted to, uh, we decided to use an open source tool for um, putting your infrastructure in code. This was called Terraform, it's just one of the many out there. And uh, basically allows you to codify your infrastructure. You can write down your clusters declaratively, you can version it, you can review changes. And while trying to adopt Terraform, unfortunately, we, we accidentally deleted not one, but two clusters. Uh, so how did this happen? Uh, this is the second story. And I'll give you some context about how we configured our clusters and how Terraform works so you understand um, the details of it. So we have a shared Git repository where we define all of our cluster level configuration and resources on, for every cluster. And this repository is used by both cluster users and by my team, the cluster operators. So it's all mixed together. Um, when we started using Terraform, we, uh, we realized that there was like a state file that Terraform wrote to the kind of like know about the state of your infrastructure. But we weren't very familiar with it. Um, so Terraform actually uses the state file to decide what it's going to do. So first, my team, when trying to get Terraform to manage these clusters, we created a pull request to import the Asia cluster uh, into the state file. And this state file actually affects what's going to happen in production. Uh, but we ran uh, review builds that actually modified the state file during a, during a review build. So let's think about that. We modified a global state file that affects what happens in production during a review build. Uh, we didn't merge this PR yet, though. And then a few minutes later, a cluster user um, who knows nothing about Terraform and shouldn't need to know anything about it, they made a pull request to add three more users to an RBAC file, an existing role binding file. And uh, they, they asked us to review it. And it looked very innocuous. It was just three extra users on an existing namespace. Um, but what was important what wasn't what was in the PR or the change file, it was what was missing. And it was missing the definition for the Asia cluster. And these two pull requests were merged out of order. So uh, that one was merged to master first. And can you guess what happens next? And that's what happened. So Terraform looked at this, and merged it in, and it was like, oh, I don't see the Asia cluster defined. I'm just going to, this, this shouldn't be here. I'm just going to get rid of it. So at this point, we thought, OK, well, it can't, it can't get any worse, right? Uh, we still have that unmerged PR. Um, oh, and when you think that, it can't get any worse, it can always get worse. It's always like, I don't know, it's like one of those phrases like, I'll do the dishes later. You know it's not going to happen. Um, so we still have that unmerged PR from the previous slide uh, that declared the Asia cluster. So we thought, OK, we'll just merge that one in, and uh, it will recreate it. So our cluster creation script actually fails halfway um, because it didn't have the right permissions. So before we were using Terraform, each of us were just uh, running a few Terraform commands locally on our, on our work laptops with our personal GCP accounts. And those personal accounts had, uh, they were owners of the project. So we had all the permissions we needed. But now we're using a service account to run these Terraform commands. And they didn't have all the permissions. So we gave it, we kind of just like gave it all the permissions it needed. Uh, but these actually were different permissions than Terraform originally used to import the clusters. And when you have different permissions and you call the Google APIs, you get different attributes. So now when Terraform gets a list of clusters from GCP, it, they have different properties because it can see more. And so these properties have changed depending on the permissions. So we use one set of permissions to import the clusters, and now we're using another set of permissions to kind of manage them. And now the clusters look different to Terraform. So that happened. Because it, it thought, I don't know about this cluster. This must be different. So at this point, we have deleted two-thirds of our production clusters from the face of the Earth. So this was pretty bad. Thankfully, it didn't get any worse than this. We didn't delete like all three this time. But this was pretty bad still. OK, let's talk about the impact, so the developer impact. 
One team had to create more non-Kubernetes VMs. They were actually running half and half, so they were running some of their capacity on Kubernetes and some on our uh, existing just straight up compute. Uh, so they had to create more to handle the load. My team realized all the places we had hard coded the old cluster's master IPs. Uh, so we had to go in and like update all of those. And a uh, kind of minor annoyance, but everyone using kubectl had to refresh their cluster credentials when we recreated the clusters that had new certificates. But otherwise, our user support Slack channel uh, internally was quiet. It was like eerily quiet, and no one paged us. So let's talk about the end user impact, like this guy who's listening to Spotify while you know, on his jog. He kept running. We had no reports of either cluster deletion affecting our end users. So first, a summary of how we did this and what we did right that prevented any end user impact. So from day one uh, of doing this complex migration, we planned for failure. Because you know things happen, things are not always going to be reliable, and there's going to be lots of mistakes on the way. And also, we, when we were migrating large-scale, complex infrastructure, we did it gradually. And this is very important uh, because it gives you time, it gave us time to build redundancy into our systems and to give us a chance to roll back in case anything went wrong during the migra migration process. And last but not least, we have a culture of learning at Spotify. So you know, we try to figure out what have we learned from this and how do we prevent the same type of mistake from happening in the future so that we only have it once. Uh, I'm going to go into more details on each of these now. So how did we plan for failure? Uh, we originally, while migrating, we told each team uh, to migrate their services just partially to Kubernetes. Don't put 100% of it on. Do half and half. Gradually ramp up. Uh, we were still building confidence in our ability to manage these clusters and to scale them up and to test out all of our custom integrations with it. The second way that saved us, the second thing that saved us was how we registered these services running on Kubernetes. And um, the result of these two is that the, the failover to non-Kubernetes instances happened uh, as we expected when the clusters were deleted. So let me be clear, these three things were not accidents, but they were deliberate choices we made to make our infrastructure more reliable and our migration process reversible. And now I'm going to go into a little more details on, on each of these three and how we did that. So for the partial migration on a per-service level, Kubernetes usage at Spotify at the time was marked as beta. Um, and what this means is that we recommended teams only migrate some, but not all, of each of their services' capacity to Kubernetes. And meanwhile, we would continue working on integrations, reliability, and managing multiple clusters at once. Uh, and we actually registered our services on Kubernetes in a, in a kind of different way, the non-Kubernetes way, um, due to interoperab interoperability reasons. So our internal uh, service discovery uses pod IPs. It doesn't use the service at all. And this internal service discovery pulls the service's endpoints, and then it updates uh, its, its pretty much it updates its internal state with the pod IPs. And then when it noticed that it couldn't reach a cluster, uh, our team was paged. And so we would have to go and actually remove that cluster from the configuration so that that service discovery mechanism would no longer pull that non-existent cluster anymore. And then what happened was that we failed over to uh, the non-Kubernetes instances. So we would restart service discovery, our internal service discovery system. And then the pod IPs would be removed. And then downstream clients that had a list, it would re gradually refresh their list of uh, backends. And it would just, you know, those pod IPs would, from Kubernetes would go away. And it would use the kind of legacy um, instances that weren't on Kubernetes anymore. And now I want to describe some of the best practices that we followed when migrating complex infrastructure to make sure that we did it gradually and we could always have a chance to reverse it if we needed to. So number one thing to do, and also a, a huge part of what saved us, was we, we backed up these clusters from day one. 
Uh, we codify that infrastructure, or started to after the first uh, cluster was deleted. We started performing disaster recovery tests, and we made sure that we practiced uh, these drills. We practiced these scenarios and actually ran through them. So our cluster backups, uh, they were essential. We had already tested restoring from these, because if you have backups, but you've never tested restoring from your backups, I'm sorry, you don't have backups, right? You just never tested them. Uh, codifying your infrastructure. So we were trying to introduce Terraform gradually, and it was, it was better than what we had, even though it, you know, there were some hiccups along the way. Um, Terraform and tools like this help us standardize our workflow and the change management of infrastructure code. We added linters and validators to make sure that the configs that we were writing were correct. We also added other things like uh, adding the output of the dry run to the comments in the pull request so that it was very obvious what it was going to do. And we use GitHub so we can have status checks that are required to pass before merging. One of these status checks is that um, the branch must be up to date. If you get a dry run based on an old master commit, it's not really what's going to happen, so that we, we turn that on, so you have to do the review build again based on the latest master. Of course, we require approving uh, pull request reviews, and we would just immediately fail uh, reviews if we detected certain keywords like destroy. You probably don't want to destroy something. We, we still do those destructions of clusters manually, but not, not in this uh, repository. So disaster recovery tests. Disasters will happen whether you plan for them or not, so it's always good to just plan for them. Uh, we schedule them in advance, and we announce widely to operators and users when we're going to do them. You also want to test different failure conditions. Uh, you maybe you want to test a cluster going away or something not as catastrophic like the control plane going down or a node not being able to be added or a pod not being able to be scheduled. And as you're going through these exercises, as you do them, just record each little issue you see um, and fix them accordingly. If it's something like a typo in a documentation or just some, some kind of tool that wasn't automated the right way. And practice makes perfect. So it took me three and a quarter hours to restore the first cluster I had deleted, along with all its integrations with the help of my team. And the second cluster deletion that actually lasted from 8 at night till 5 in the morning. But now we can actually restore clusters that are way bigger than the ones we deleted before in one hour. So I think that's a huge improvement. And I'm also very grateful and thankful that Spotify's engineering teams have a great culture of learning, not blame. So I was freaking out when I deleted that cluster. Uh, my team, though, was very supportive, and you know, they said things like, it's better now than never. You know, this would have happened anyways, and they actually said, oh, we learned so much from doing this. They stopped short of like, thank you for deleting it on a Friday, but <laughs> you know, it was still good that that happened before we got too many users on. So we're all human, and uh, we've all made mistakes. Uh, what is important isn't who made the mistake, but what you learned and how you can prevent making that same type of mistake in the future. So to recap what prevented that end user impact, uh, we planned for failure from the very beginning. We migrated large scale infrastructure very gradually. That gave us time to build redundancy, reliability, and uh, reversibility into that process. And we have a culture of learning. So the next steps for us uh, using Kubernetes at Spotify, uh, I'm very happy to say that as of last Monday, we kind of flipped the switch Kubernetes is available for everyone to use, and it's marked as generally available at Spotify, which means that we've kind of lifted that recommendation against running your service entirely on Kubernetes. We feel confident enough that you can take your mission-critical service and run it 100% on Kubernetes. And we now have to, we are in the process of figuring out or have already kind of made good progress on um, managing configuration around how do we distribute workloads among multiple clusters since we have five in each region now? And how do we create more redundancy for services? Maybe we want to deploy these services to multiple clusters within a single region. 
So that's my talk. Uh, I want to, again, thank the CNCF and Spotify for this opportunity. Um, I want to thank my team for all their hard work for making Kubernetes a reality in production. And I want to thank all of you here for attending. Uh, Spotify is a great place to work. If you're looking, we're hiring. We're also using the latest uh, cloud native technologies to make the entire music ecosystem uh, work better for everyone. So my name is David. You can find me on Twitter here. Thank you so much.